Lord, we come to you today to honor you and to glorify you, to learn from you, to worship you, to connect with you, to be transformed by you. And uh, you're right here. You're meeting us. We thank you so much for that. And we say, do it, Lord, whatever you want to do this morning. We make room for whatever you want to do. We just pray for your kingdom to come and your perfect will to be done amongst us today. And the thing that I'm sharing today, uh, I know the enemy doesn't like it. And so I just stand against his works in the name of Jesus. And I take authority over every demonic spirit that might be here today and command it to be gone from here. And that your people would be released to be able to hear the word of God and to be transformed, that it wouldn't just go into their heads, but into their hearts and into their spirits. Dedicate this morning, we ded- I dedicate this teaching to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so uh, the, the, the timing is going to seem a little weird on this, but um, I, I have a reason for it. You've now got your coffee, you've got your donuts, it's sitting in your lap, you're all comfortable. I'm going to ask you to put that down for a minute. And what I'm going to have you do is don't move yet. Let me give you the instructions first. Uh, but what I'm going to have you do is, is join up with one other person, uh, at the most, uh, you know, two other people, so a group of three. But I'm only going to give you two minutes. And what you're going to do is you're going to share a prayer need, uh, you know, uh, this a prayer request, uh, you need God's intervention, his healing, uh, you need a breakthrough, you need provision for something. But you don't want to... You know, when you're sharing, you don't want to go, it all started when I was a child. And, you know, my dad didn't, you know, it, the type of sharing that you want to do is, I need healing for my ear. As a matter of fact, I need healing for my ear. Uh, but actually, I, it's a little better, Chelsea. Thank you. It is better than it was this morning. I had Chelsea take authority over something that was going on in my ear this morning. But anyway, you, get, you understand what I'm asking you to do? So you're going to connect with one other person, you're going to share a prayer need, and then you're going to pray for that person, and and I'm going to bring you back together in two minutes. Are you ready? On your mark, get set, go. Okay, so if you've been attending home church for a few weeks or a few months, you'll know that during the Christmas season, during December, we went through a series, God With Us. And during this... uh, Oh, and we're about to go into another series, which is going to start next week, and I won't tell you what it is. Uh, it'll be, you know, a little bit of a surprise. It'll be kind of a, a little different thing for us. Uh, so today is kind of a, one of the, what, what, we, what we would call a, a, a bumper sermon, <laughs> kind of the in bet- a standalone. And um, since I, I just got the, uh, you know, the signal that, uh, that I was on, ba- you know, on deck for uh, preaching like a day ago, uh, you know, it was like, oh, okay, what, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? <laughs> and I, if you remember, I, I had the opportunity to preach uh, on December 17th, and I took too long, and I didn't get a chance to finish, and so I, this is kind of part two. <laughs> So this is kind of part two of this, and uh, I'm titling it Standing in Authority in 2024. Here we are in a new year, and hopefully this will be an encouragement for us to rise up and to stand in authority in 2024. We learned over the past month that God is with us. God, he is God to us, that he is God in us in us, and he is God through us. And he's revealing his character and nature to the world and establishing his kingdom authority through us all. Last week, we had the privilege of hearing Richmond uh, preach, and he spent quite a bit of time on, on the kingdom. And if you haven't had a chance to listen to that message, I highly encourage you to go back and do so. You can uh, link on it uh, you know, on our website. But uh, in that message, Richmond talked about the conductor and the insulator. And if you're not familiar, 
The, the conductor is the electric wires, and the insulator are those, those round things, you know, kind of look like clamshell type things. And Richmond sh shared that a conductor is a material that allows current to flow through them easily. On the other hand, insulators do not allow current to flow through them. And Richmond challenged us. He said, are you a conductor or are you an insulator? Are you allowing God to flow through you to touch your generation? Or are you an insulator where no current can flow through you? You know, uh, we're heading into 2024 here. and We don't know what, what this year is going to hold for God's people. We all have probably looked ahead. You know, we have, I'm sure we have different opinions. You know, if you look at the news, it can, you know, with all, everything going on in the world, it can, you know, get a little, a little scary. Uh, if you listen to, you know, some other voices, like some of the prophetic voices, it's like, yeah, we're heading into, you know. So there are different opinions. My own, so what I'm going to share with you is just my own humble opinion it's not a church position or anything like that. It's just a, my own personal opinion. I think that 2024 could be one of the most pivotal years in the history of mankind. Seriously. And I'm a history geek. I think it could be that big. This is a turning point. This is a pivot point. I believe that the sins of many that have been hidden and kept secret for many years may be revealed and displayed for all to see. And there'll be many who will, it'll just be so unbelievably weird and bad that there'll be many that just ref refuse to believe it. They won't be able to receive it. It could be a difficult year in some respects, testing our faith, testing our courage, but also a tremendous blessing for those who join God in his kingdom expansion. I believe that God may move in miraculous ways, displaying signs and wonders, healings and deliverances, causing many, thousands, maybe even millions to come to know Jesus Christ. And I believe that God will bless the home church causing it to grow in both numbers and kingdom effectiveness. And I believe that with all my heart. That's not just, you know, bloviating or, you know, wishful thinking. I believe that. I, you know, I can see it with my mind's eye. I can, you know, my, the, you know, the vision, I can see it. But whatever happens, it is essential that we learn to stand in our authority this year, in 2024. So that's what I'm going to be sharing on today, and hopefully I'll share in such a way that you'll be motivated to not just affirm it intellectually, oh yeah, okay, we've got to stand on our authority, but you will actually do it. In Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 13, we read an account of a centurion who had a servant that was deathly ill. And of course, the centurion is a, the, the leader of a, a, Roman, a group of, a Rome, of Roman soldiers, a centurion, I believe, is for 100, 100 soldiers. And this is the account. It says, when he, Jesus, had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. But only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, truly, truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. 
I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. What he's talking about here, the sons of the kingdom are the Jewish people who eventually, you know, who would reject their Messiah. And he's saying those from, other, you know, from multitudes of nations, those who aren't, who aren't of the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will spend eternity with, you know, with them. But those whom the Messiah was sent to, who rejected him, will be thrown into outer darkness. It says, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion, Jesus said, go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. This centurion understood that he himself was a man in authority over those under him and that they must obey. But he understood that his authority didn't ride, reside in himself. But his authority was an extension of the authority that was over him. So the authority was flowing through him. He was working under, that de- under delegated authority. And he understood that Jesus was under God's authority and thus had the authority to command sickness and demonic oppression to leave, even from a distance. You don't need to come into my house. I'm not worthy. Just say the word and these demons, I, am, I believe. I believe that these demons or this sickness will have to flee. And Jesus marveled at the centurion's understanding of this kingdom authority and said that this was the essence of faith. God has called you and me to be kingdom ambassadors. We are under Jesus' authority and we represent him to the world. We stand in his delegated authority and overcome the works of darkness. It's not us doing the work, it's his spirit within us doing the works through us. And he is calling us to exercise that kingdom authority, to go beyond mere intercessions, God, do you know, help, 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 to, be, to have bold, authoritative declarations. I think this picture is funny. You know, a man's sitting there taking this woman's license and probably he's, he's about to, uh, you know, give her a ticket. I'm not, I'm not sure that I would be smiling quite the way she is if I was in the same situation. Seems like this is a photo op uh, set up by the police department. But <laughs> in any case, uh, you know, here you've got this policeman. And it's obvious that he has pulled this woman over. Now, have you ever thought about that? Why, why, would, why would she pull over? Well, she might get arrested, but she would get arrested, I mean, why? Well, she did something wrong, but who gave this person, this person in this funny-looking uniform the authority to stop her and to give her a ticket and possibly arrest her. Okay, the law and the state, right? Now, if this person who's in this uniform wasn't in the uniform and he wasn't in his police car and he was falling behind the same gal, waving his hand going, stop, stop. Do you think she, should, she would stop? Do you think she should stop? No. <laughs> Could be a carjacking, right? And if he, if he walk, you know, walks up to the window, uh, ma'am, you were speeding, well, you know, what would her response be? <laughs> What's it to you? Right? So the authority doesn't reside in the person themselves, but in the legal authority that they represent, the office that they hold and the uniform that they wear. And I would propose that we need to know the legal authority that we represent and the office that we hold. And if you will, the spiritual uniform that we wear. 
We need to learn to speak with authority and to make declarations, doing spiritual warfare. Back in November, we went through a series uh, on the importance of spiritual warfare. I believe Pastor Hector taught that series. And he taught a lot, and it was really good. And we, I'm sure we learned a lot, but even with that head knowledge, I think that many people are uncertain on how to do it. They might be able to affirm, oh, yeah, okay, I'm supposed to do spiritual warfare. Okay, good. What does that mean? How do I do it? What are the mechanics? You know, do I go down to Bass Pro and, you know, buy a hunting machete? Or, what, you know, what, what, what are you really saying I should do? I don't pretend to be an expert in this area. You know, I, I, I feel a little like, uh, uh, you know, I'm taking you on an airplane ride and I'm getting into the pilot seat, but I've never been to a pilot school. And I'm just a passenger like you are. But in grade school, I made great paper airplanes. And so that makes me an authority, right? And that's kind of the way I feel in sharing about prayer because prayer is not one of my strong points. It's one of my weak points. I don't pray often enough. (laughs) Anybody relate to that? Yeah? No? Okay, well, good. (laughs) You You keep praying. (laughs) If you do your thing, I'll do mine, right? Come on up, sister. (laughs) I love it. Oh. But I have had some practical experience, you know, trying to think. I've had over 40 years of ministry experience. That's, That's amazing to me. So I've had some practical experience and a little bit of instruction, and I'll gladly pass some of what I've learned on to you. Today is going to be a very practical, hands-on message. And it's primarily going to be for Christ followers. So if you're here today and you're not a Christ follower, some, a lot of this is going to be like, huh? Eh? You know, kind of over, over your head. But, but that's okay. I think you can learn a lot today too. At least give, get the essence of, you know, a little bit of what this whole Christianity thing is about. So earlier, when you prayed for another, how did you pray? Think about it. Did you pray with authority? Did you pray with power? Did you pray with declarations as a representative of the kingdom? Or, as I shared a couple weeks ago, did you go, hey, 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 God, would you heal that person? Hey, 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 God, would you deliver this person? Hey, 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 God, would you, you know, when God may be saying, I live inside of you, I've given you my authority. I've come to establish my kingdom and bring down Satan's kingdom. I've made you my kingdom ambassadors. I've given you the keys of the kingdom to bind and loose here on earth according to heaven's plans. I commanded, commissioned you to do greater works than I did. Why are you telling me to do it? Go do what I've called you to do. Go do what I've called you to do. We need to somehow make that switch because I think our default, and I, I have to admit, this is my default too. If somebody asks me to pray for you, okay, okay, I'll pray for you. God, please heal this person. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with that. But there are times where it's, you have to go beyond, God, please heal that person. God, please heal that person to be healed in the name of Jesus. Believing that God's power and authority are working through you. You are a channel for God's power, his giftings, the establishment or the expansion of his kingdom. You know, I think about that, that, uh, that policeman picture that I had there. You know, can, can you imagine, you know, uh, car 54 to base? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I've, I've got a person who uh, has been uh, speeding. Okay, go ahead. Uh, could you please uh, give them a ticket? Uh, a base here, uh, what do you mean? Uh, could you please give them a ticket? Uh, excuse me, but uh, you're the officer on patrol. You're the one out who has stopped this car. You have the authority, you give them the ticket. Yeah. 
we need to start giving tickets to our adversary. <laughs> Putting them in jail. <laughs> we need to expand in our ambassador role to go beyond from these just intercession and requests into taking authority and to giving commands and making de declarations. Let's see how Jesus sh shows us how to pray with authority. In Mark chapter 1, verse 23 through 25, it says, Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? And the answer is yes. That's not what Jesus said, but that's what I would have said. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet. And come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Now you notice that Jesus didn't say, okay, hold on a second. Father, would you please remove the demon out of this man? And Jesus didn't go into a, a, a 10 minute you know, diatribe Oh, God of heaven and earth. It, you know what I mean? It was very simple. Something needed to be done. He said, be quiet and come out of him. Let's take a look at another one. Mark 4, verse 39. Jesus was in, in the boat. It's the story of, you know, about the wind and the waves. And they, you know, we're going to sink. Then Jesus arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace. Be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He didn't try and counsel the wind. And go back and figure out, you know, the childhood hurts of the wind. You know what I mean? He's just very direct. Peace, be still. Uh, Mark chapter 5, verses 40 through 42. And they ridiculed him, ridiculed Jesus. But when he had put them all outside, this is uh, the account of Jairus' daughter who had died. But when he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. Then he took the child by the hand and sent, said to her, Talitha kume, which is translated little girl. I say to you, arise. Immediately, the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement. You know, as I play that situation in my mind, I start crying. <laughs> Children are so precious. And to lose a child, and then to have Jesus come and say, little girl, arise. In the heart of a compassionate heart that he had. And to see her rise up. Oh my goodness. I, I, I'd, I'd do anything to, to have seen that. But it wasn't just about Jesus because you might think in your heart, well, this is Jesus. Of course, he has authority. Well, let's look at what the disciples, uh, how the disciples uh, modeled, uh, you know, praying in authority. Acts chapter three, verse six through seven. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Rise up and walk. A command, a declaration. Acts 14, 9. This man heard Paul speaking. Paul observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed seeing that he had faith to be healed. He didn't hear the man say, I have faith to be healed. There was something that Paul had. He had, was given at that, at that moment, the ability uh, 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 to see in, his, in the spiritual realm, upon this man, a level of faith that would open him up for healing. He, he was able to see the, the hand of God working upon this man for healing. And in my experience, I've seen this many times. You'll be looking at somebody and, and it's almost like there's a, 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 
you know, kind of a, 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 a I, I, I can't explain it. It's, it's a, like a sixth, sixth, I can't say it because I have a list. S-I-X-T-H, sixth sense. <laughs> That's horrible. <laughs> Who invented that word? <laughs> that extra sense to be able to see as you're looking at a person, being able to see the hand of God, being able to see the working of God. It's almost like a, 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 you know, like when you're looking on a desert and you see the, the, you know, the heat waves, the, the, like the mirage type stuff. It's, it's almost kind of like that a little bit. But you begin, if, if you are praying for people a lot, you begin to recognize this. And this is what uh, Paul saw. And he saw that he had faith to be healed and said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet. Well, that took some guts, don't you think? And he leapt and walked. What, what, what if God wasn't healing the man? How embarrassing that would be to say, stand up straight on your feet, and the person didn't get healed. Oh, my. What do we do with that? But there are times where we have to step out in faith and make those types of declarations. Acts chapter 16, verse 16 through 18. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paula and us and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Was that the truth? That was the truth. But the people in the city knew that she was working from a different spirit. And so it had the effect of undermining their testimony, thinking that they were connected with her and what she was doing. And this she did for many days, but Paul, greatly annoyed, I'd be annoyed too. Do you ever get annoyed? <laughs> greatly. <laughs> but Paul, greatly annoyed, t turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he did. Why is it difficult to speak with simple authority like that, like we see examples in the scripture? Why is it so difficult? Mm, exactly. We aren't convinced of God's goodness sometimes. It's a relationship issue. Sometimes we aren't convinced of God's sovereignty and what he's able to do. It's a faith and expectation issue. Sometimes we don't believe who we are as his children and ambassadors. It's an identity issue. Sometimes we don't believe that we have the power it's an authority and jurisdiction issue. Or perhaps we don't see immediate results. And so it's a persistence and patience issue. And perhaps a process issue, as, as Richmond shared last week, because we, we're all going through process, you know, developing our character. We need, sometimes we need to be patient and wait. But in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, in the Amplified, it says, ask and keep asking, keep on asking, and it will be given to you. Seek, and keep on seeking, and you will find. Knock, and keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. And sometimes we may not be confident of what God wants to do in this particular situation. And that's very valid. Because, you know, we can, we can pray for people all day long, but it doesn't mean they're going to get healed. You're only going to get it healed is if that's what the Father is doing at that point. John chapter 5, verse 19 through 20. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. But the important point here is the son can do nothing of himself. Even Jesus couldn't do any supernatural, miraculous work 
if God wasn't the, the one behind it and appointing it. John 12, verse 49, Jesus said, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. John chapter 14, 10, uh, verse 10 through 14, the word, this is Jesus again, the words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, this is you, he's talking about you, if you believe in him, the works that I do, you will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So there's this principle that just because we want something to happen doesn't mean it's going to happen. Just because we pray for somebody doesn't mean we're going to see the results. Because remember, whether it's the policeman stopping the, stopping the gal in his police car and uniform, or, or it's us acting as kingdom ambassadors, we only have authority to the extent that it's been delegated to us. So if God isn't working in somebody's life right now, he might do it later. But if today God's not working in a person, you can't make it happen. You can't say, you know, you, you can use all the fancy Christian words and everything, but you cannot make it happen. It's not about you making something happen. It's about you being obedient to God and being led by the Holy Spirit and being a channel for him to do what he wants to do in this place, in this time, in this person's life. But you can't do anything beyond that. Stepping out in the Holy Spirit's authority and power requires extra faith and admittedly risk, but also a great reward. What a blessing it is to be involved in the work of God. There's a gentleman named Pastor Glenn Schroeder. He's part of the Vineyard Churches. He says, faith is spelled R-I-S-K. It's like jumping off the diving board and trusting God to fill the pool before you land. And it's really true. I mean, that's a great visual because sometimes it feels like that. I mean, I, I've had people you know, say, uh, could you could you pray that my you know for you know for whatever it is you know and it's you you know something major, and, and you know like a well I, I don't know can't even think of it but you know something major and in my mind I'm thinking oh dude <laughs> you know, here here I am I know I got to pray for this person I don't necessarily have the faith but they might have the faith to be healed and so I need to be obedient to to pray for them. But it is a little like, I don't know what I'm stepping into. And I don't know what the results are going to be. Kind of like that, that empty pool. And you're jumping in, trusting that God's going to fill the pool before you, you hit the cement. When we pray, we are trusting God to hear, to respond. Every time we step out and ask God to heal, we are taking a risk and exercising faith. Faith is a commitment to move in a direction toward God. It is not being certain of the outcome. <clears throat> I think I'm going to probably, that's my doggy Daisy. <laughs> uh, I've got some really important things to share. I think I'm going to skip by Daisy today. And I'm going to skip by this video too. Why do our prayers of authority and declarations not always work? Well, I've covered one of them, you know, one of the reasons in just a moment ago. Maybe God's not working. 
Do we know and believe who God is? Do we have faith and expectation that God will work? Are we convinced who we are as his kingdom ambassadors? Do we have a relationship of intimacy and mutual trust with our master? Are we familiar enough with our master's still small voice that we can hear it and recognize it when he's speaking and giving direction? Do we have spiritual eyes and discernment to know what our master's will is? We have to have, that, that video I was going to show you is a, of a, a border collies and, and just the relationship that they have with their master and how incredibly intelligent they are and how incredibly intuitive they are. And it's that, that bond between the master and the dog is, is just unbelievable. And that's, you know, that's kind of the, the type of relationship that we need to have with God if we're going to be effective in you know, standing in authority. We need, to, we need to be close enough to him and be, recognize his voice enough and, and, and be listening and be looking and watching so that we pick up on his cues and his leading and we can flow with him in what he's doing. but it is certain that not all of your authority prayers and declarations will be answered. However, it is certain that there will be more answers to your prayers if you keep doing it than if you you didn't pray with authority but instead hesitated out of fear of failure. We We need to overcome that fear of failure and to do it anyway. Becoming more effective in our prayers of authority, it's not about saying the right words in the right way. We aren't Christian sorcerers saying incantations, heaven forbid, you know? But, but we can't, we, let's, let's face it, human nature. We, 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 we get into this, you know, we kind of, you know, we, we, we see somebody pray and we see results of that prayer, and it's like, oh, that's the way you do it. And, and so you kind of mimic the same words, you know. And it's not about the words. It's not about the length of your prayers. <laughs> you know, on and on and on. Or the eloquence of your speech. It's not about expressing extra volume or energy, you know, I don't know if you've ever been around a deliverance type of situation, but I, you know, I've been around a number of them. It, it always seems like the volume in the room starts to rise. Come out of him, come out of him, come out of him in the name of Jesus. You know, it, you know the, it, it's not about that. Your extra volume will not help. Your extra energy won't help. And, you know, in, in some of the charismatic Pentecostal uh, you know, culture, there's, you know, even, you know, situation. I, I, was, at a, I was invited to a conference um, just this last year, and there was a speaker, and his teaching was good enough. It was, it was valid enough, but he had a prayer time, and he would go around, and he would come up and lay hands on you, and, and you could, you know, I was watching. You could see him, you know, pushing, pushing, you know, and, and he, had, he had people already behind ready to catch, you know, now, I, I personally have experience being what's called slain in the spirit. And it was an authentic type of a thing. So I'm, I'm not knocking the reality of that experience, but I am knocking it when it's being manipulated and forced. And there's an expectation by the person being prayed, oh, I'm supposed to fall over. Okay. Eh. You know, and there's a person pushing, you know, ready to help them do it. Yeah, I've got a real problem with that. I've found that adrenaline that's created by the, the, you know, the energy and excitement and everything, that it's a byproduct of the flesh and not of the spirit. And it can actually quench the working of the spirit. It gets in the way. It's not about the numbers of people praying. Oh, we gotta get, we gotta get 50 people praying. We gotta get 100 people praying. No. If God's gonna do his work, you only need one. Ideally two as a witness. But it's not about the numbers of people in order to see God's work. And it's not about how you feel. I can't tell you how many times I've, 
uh, you know, I've been in a situation praying for people. I was like, I don't feel any anointing right now, okay? I just want to go home and watch the 49ers. <laughs> One thirty this afternoon, by the way. <laughs> and it's not even about the amount of faith that you personally have, because you may not have any faith whatsoever to see the work of God in this situation, but the person does. And sometimes it's, you don't have the faith, the person doesn't have the faith, but God wants to do it anyway. It is about being confident in who God is, allowing yourself to be aware of his presence. It's all about his presence. You've got a sense, while you're praying for somebody, you've got a sense, God's right there with you. Not only is he with you, he's in you. It's about being confident in who you are as a child of God and as a kingdom ambassador. Apart apart from how you feel or what you may be struggling with, none of those things really matter. But you need to have this consciousness that, no, right now, I'm functioning as an ambassador of my king. I don't feel it, but that doesn't matter. That's who I am right now. It's about being available and resisting fear especially the fear of failure. Richmond shared last week, I'm going to quote him. He said, you see, most of the time, God is not looking for people that are anointed. He's looking for people that are willing and available. Anytime God wants to work through his people, he looks around and sees who is available. And once you are available and you are not even anointed, he picks you and anoints you and he works through you. And that is what I see God doing in your life. And it's about getting out of the way. Stepping out of your flesh, dying to yourself, and allowing the Spirit of God within you to be front and center at that moment. I, uh, Galatians 2.20, I shared this a couple weeks ago, this scripture, I I, I use this scripture all the time. I used it this morning before I came up here. I quoted it, internalized it. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So there's this, this principle, and it may not help you. It helps me. Uh, and I, I, I am watching the clock, by the way. <laughs> I'm watching it tick, 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 tick. <laughs> I'm watching the worship team. <laughs> yeah, worship team, watch, come on up. <laughs> but let's see if this helps you. Uh, if you've seen the, the Wizard of Oz, seen the Wizard of Oz? You know that scene where the, where the, the witch lights the, the straw man on fire? And Dorothy grabs the, the water pail and throws water on, you know, to put him out and the water gets on the witch? And the water starts melting? Or, I'm sorry, the witch starts melting? And she says, oh, what a world, what a world! And, she, and, and what she, we end up with is a pile of clothes on the ground. I, when I'm going into a, a situation like this, I literally go through that in in my mind and heart, and I even visualize it. I am crucified with Christ. There I go. There I go, down into the ground. I'm crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. It's no longer I who's standing here right now. But it's Christ who's standing here. Christ who lives in me. And that has really helped me to, to actually visualize, okay, I died in my flesh right now. Okay, you are dead. Now I'm, alive. now I'm stepping in as an ambassador of Christ with the Holy Spirit inside of me with his full power and authority ready to work through me. Maybe that'll help you some. But don't try and manufacture I'm trying to move ahead here. 
Don't try to manufacture or make up anything when you're praying for people. Either God's working or he's not. Listen and expect for God to speak. Try and to feel and sense what may be going on in the room spiritually, both by God and his angels and also our adversary. I would encourage you when you're praying, keep your eyes open. Both your natural eyes and your spiritual eyes. Keep them open for clues about what's going on. As you're praying for people and taking authority, consider spiritual strongholds and negative pronouncements that have been made in people's lives and break the power of those. And as Richmond shared last week, avoid counseling demons. <laughs> Get right to the point. So hopefully, the, you know, this has been of some help to you today. You know, really getting down to the practical level of this idea of spiritual warfare and taking authority. And like I said, I think this year we're going to need it. And there's going to be this tendency, there's always this tendency in a congregation to look at the people up front like myself or the worship leaders or, you know, or maybe the elders and say, oh good, I'm so glad they're doing the work. I'm so glad they're taking care of the spiritual things. We can't, that's done. That's done. You are the army of God. And this year especially, I don't think anybody can afford to stand on the sidelines or to be in the, ple be in the bleachers applauding all the spiritual people out on this field. No, get your uniform on. Get out on the field. Start standing in authority. Start working in the kingdom and accomplishing what God wants to do in you and through you. In Jesus' name. Let me pray for you, and then I'll let the worship team do <laughs> recover whatever they can. <laughs> Father, thank you uh, for this relationship that we have with you, where you've called us to be your ambassadors, not only your children, but your ambassadors to extend your authority, your delegated authority in the, in the, in the world. What an unbelievable privilege. And then to have you actually living inside of us. Oh my goodness. Thank you for allowing us to partner with you in the work that you're doing in the earth. Lord, keep us faithful. Make us faithful. Help us to break free of fear. Fear of failure. Fear of the unknown. And to enter into this area of spiritual authority. I pray for every single person here that they would sense that, that stirring in their, in their soul, in their spirit, that they would sense you moving and calling them out onto the front lines of this battle, calling them out onto the field of this game to participate and to be a member of your army. Lord, bless these people. This is going to be an exciting year ahead. I don't know what it holds, but it's going to be a doozy. Both, both difficult and excellent. So we look forward to what you're going to do with joy, with gladness, with anticipation. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.